Hi, my name is Heidi. I hope you can hear me. I, I, I can hear the speaker. My cancer journey started in 2009. I was diagnosed with highly undifferentiated endometrial sarcoma. I've only heard of three other people in the whole world who have had that diagnosis. Uh, most people never see it in the medical community. It was already end stage with the most aggressive self. I was terrified. I was in shock. I didn't even know what questions to ask. I'd never even heard, didn't even know what a sarcoma was. So, you remember being diagnosed? Yes. Yep. Feels like a death sentence, doesn't it? Feels like you're under attack. And I was a mother. What was going to happen to my kids? I had an 11 year old at home. At that point, I knew I needed to do everything I could to survive. Everything the doctors wanted and everything else I could figure out on my own. So I went through two years of chemotherapy because between the time I was diagnosed and the time I started chemo, I went from one tumor in my lungs to four in about six weeks. And I was draconian with my diet and I was meditating and visualizing doing affirmations and everything else I could think of. And the stuff was growing like crazy. The chemo slowed it down. It actually got rid of some of the tumors. So chemo absolutely saved my life. Some people like Ann can't do chemo. But for me, it saved my life. It's one of many things that saved my life. Here I am after two years, almost two years of chemo. This is a 22 months for my 50th birthday. Happy birthday. Happy We're birthday. running out of chemo options for you. Huh? Two months later, I had my final scan after my final chemo option. There was a half inch tumor growing on my pulmonary vein right next to my heart. My oncologist didn't think that the surgeon could get it. I called my surgeon and I said, can you get this thing out? And he said, we're going to try. We did. I went to my post-op appointment six weeks after surgery. I asked the woman how big was the tumor. She said it was two and a half inches. It grew from half an inch to two and a half inches in five weeks. That's how aggressive it was. As she said, you need to get back on chemo. I see this all the time. You have to do this. And I said, this is a very rare cancer. There is no more chemo. She looked me in the eye and she said, get your affairs in order. And my next scan was clean. And my next scan was clean. It's now been six and a half years. Yeah. Good for you. I'm happy to be here. I'm a miracle. Now, while I was doing my two years of chemo, I wasn't sitting around just doing chemo. I was doing everything I could think of to save my life. I looked at lists of people who were in radical remission. What were they doing that made them different, that made their outcome different? And I looked at several lists, and I simmered it down to three basic ideas. If you look at these lists, you'll find they fit into these categories. I changed my attitudes, I changed my behaviors, and I made some major life choices. I completely transformed my life. Now when I was diagnosed, I was meditating an hour every day, I was doing visualizations, I maintained my weight, I exercised, I ate organic food, it wasn't enough. I was still diagnosed with highly aggressive end stage cancer, so I knew I had to do these things. After I was clean for a while, my friends came to me and they said, you have got to use your journalism background to write a guidebook to help other people to survive cancer. And that's how my book, Driver Student, was born. 
It is full of pages of resources in the back. Everything is in sections so you can find out what it is that you want to know more about and find the resource in the back. I've got over 250 practical healing solutions in this book. Most of them are dry. And it made a difference, obviously. The other thing about it is, it's endorsed by surgeons and nurses. This is a nurse. She's flying around talking about how my book saved her life. So this book is really valuable. And I want to share it with you because I want to help people get healthy. So the first thing I had to do was change my attitude. If I didn't change my attitudes, nothing else was going to change. When I was diagnosed, I was actually a really good victim. And I just gave in too much. And my sister said, get thee to a therapist. So I did. She's a clinical psychologist. She saved my life. She taught me how to manage my emotions so that I did not get sick or get sicker and so that I could actually get better. So she taught me about emotions, and I have a whole section in my book about how to manage your emotions. When I am a victim, I am experiencing an emotion, but I'm not processing it in my body. She taught me how to process my emotions in a healthy way. The emotion behind victim is hurt. She said, Feel the hurt in your body without thinking about it, without judging it, without making stories about it. Just experience the physical sensation of hurt. Now, when I have an emotion, my brain dumps chemicals into my bloodstream for the fight, flight, or freeze response. Only 90 seconds, because that's how long it takes to run, climb a tree, freeze, and then the body washes it out and it's gone. So after 90 seconds of feeling the physical sensation of hurt, I can, it's out of my body, the sensation is gone, I can think about something else. I don't have to be trapped in the victim mode. Victim is the thinking behind the emotion, or on top of the emotion. Worry. Here, here doesn't worry. What's the emotion behind worry? Fear. Where do you feel fear in your body? In your chest? Stomach. Stomach. That's what to focus on. When you've got that scan coming up, and you feel that, that surge of fear, stop the thinking and focus on the sensation instead. And then after 90 seconds, the sensation will lift, and you can redirect your thinking to something else. Anger. It's actually healthy for cancer patients to experience their anger for the first year. But if you get stuck in anger, you're going to have hostility and blame and resentment. My therapist said I was dripping with resentment when I came to start seeing her. I had to get below the neck into my body to experience the anger as it was happening. It comes into the body. 90 seconds, and it lives. Now, if I start thinking again about what I'm resentful about, my brain dumps more chemicals in my body, 90 seconds later, it lives. After those 90 seconds, I can redirect my thinking. So, now, cancer patients are always told, you have to have a positive attitude. Well, studies actually show that a positive attitude is detrimental to people with late stage cancer because they're less likely to do everything they need to do to survive. What I'm promoting is a good attitude, a genuine good attitude by changing your attitudes into healthier ones. So, Bonnie is a fiber soup reader from Portland, Texas. She had breast cancer. Now at first people came out of the woodwork to help her because her husband was out traveling all the time and she had a couple of young teenagers. But after a while, people went back into the woodwork. I'm sure you've experienced that. Bonnie got more and more resentful. The solution. She read the driver's soup entry 
resentment, raging pool, and realized that she needed to do something with her resentment to help her heal her life. So she wrote all her, her, her resentments out, page after page after page, shredded it all, and worked on gratitude. That's a good attitude. And she found that her energy was lighter, and people came back out of the woodwork to help her. She got the help she needed, she got the rest she needed, she got the treatment she, she needed. And she wasn't living with this cloud over her all the time. This is where we want to get. This is a good attitude. This is Malala. She's under constant threat from terrorists, but she has equanimity. That's what we want. That's a good attitude, where you're not overwhelmed by your emotions and where you're not repressing them. So that's a section I have in my book about how to do that. Now, I spent a year trying to understand this and another year learning how to practice it. So it took me years to really get good at this, but it serves me very well. It's helping me stay healthy. So after we have a, a reconstruct, changed our attitude, we can begin reconstructing our behaviors. Diet, of course, is what we're talking about this time. When there's something in your blood called albumin, it's a, it's a determinant of nutritional status. If your albumin level that you can get with a blood draw is below 2.5, you're probably not going to have a, a good prognosis, whatever the type of stage of cancer. If your albumin is 3.5 or above, you're probably going to have a better prognosis. When I was diagnosed with highly aggressive end stage cancer, my albumin level was 4.2. It was already very high. It was shocking to my oncologist. She couldn't believe it. So I knew from that that diet was not going to save my life. But it made me a whole lot more comfortable. I was told I would lose my hair within 21 days. It took 21 months. And as you can see, the bottle dropped my home over. <laughs> it made me much more comfortable than I would have been if I hadn't started out with a high nutritional status and kept it high. It's now about 5.0. And I talk in my book, I have a whole section on nutrition, on how to maximize your nutritional status and get that inflammation down. If you get the inflammation down, you'll have a lot less pain. The normal inflammation is between 1 and 4, and mine is 0 0.3. And I don't have trouble with pain. Now, of course, if you have treatments, then there, there's going to be pain. But you can reduce that a lot. When I was in the hospital after my last surgery, the anesthesiologist came into my room and he was angry. He said, why aren't you staying ahead of the pain? Why aren't you taking your morphine? And I said, I don't want it. I'd rather feel beat up than take that stuff. And I really didn't need it. I was uncomfortable. There's a difference between uncomfortable and pain. And with the opioid crisis right now, getting off those opioids as quick as you can is really important. Another behavior change is the attitude adjustments that we need to make. To have a good attitude. To deal with it. It's a behavior. It's a practice. First you have to choose to do it, then you have to practice it as a behavior. A woman named Grace is in a retirement community. She lives with her cat. And she's in her 70s and she did not save her retirement. So she has a tremendous amount of anxiety about how she's going to take care of herself. And the solution for her was in regular soup, in the entry called anxiety pills. And she realized that what she needed to do was when she was experiencing anxiety, to stop thinking and get in her body and experience the fear. And after 90 seconds, it will live. It's a practice. You have to remember to do it, and then you have to actually do it. By the way, she's freed up a lot more energy now since she's learned how to handle her anxiety by being able to do more exercise and eating better. And spiritual practice. A daily spiritual practice can be invaluable. Studies show that in 10% of people who start up a meditation practice, that they have shrinkage in their tumors. It's really important. Now, what I realized when I was going through chemo, I had been meditating an hour every day before I got diagnosed with cancer. 
but I realized I was not doing the right kind of meditation for me. I lived in my head before cancer. I needed to get into my body. So I learned about this other spiritual practice, where, and I talked about how to do it on my book. You have a straight spine, you can do this lying on your bed, you can do this standing in the grocery store line, you can do it right now. Straight spine, palms up, be receptive. Ask for your fears and doubts to be let go. Ask to be filled with faith and trust. And ask to be filled with healing energy. And then you just focus on what sensations you experience in your body. 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. So I might feel my feet in my shoes. I might feel what the chair feels like underneath me. I might feel heat, pressure, tingling. After doing this different practice for a couple of months, my whole body woke up. It was wonderful. It feels really good to do this practice. Now I have five minutes for a guided visualization. <laughs> so it's not much time, but it's something. I have these available on CD, and what we're going to do is we're going to go, I'm going to do a real quick one, so you're not going to go very deep, but you're going to go to your third eye right here. This is the eye of perception. We're going to close our eyes, relax, go here. I ask you to pick out a guide. It can be a dog, it can be an angel, it can be a friend, but your imaginary guide is going to go with you into your body to a place of dis-ease where you can ask the cells questions. And the music is by Sunfell. And then I'll bring you out and continue with my talk. So close your eyes, get relaxed, keep your spine straight. Just relax your body the best you can. Imagine a light coming in through your head. And going all the way down through your body, relaxing it as much as possible. Let go of thinking about sounds, other thoughts. Let them go like a healing for balloon. And just get into your body. As relaxed as you can be. Do a little deep breathing and then let the breath go and don't worry about it anymore. Just become supple and relaxed. And when you're ready, bring your inner attention to your third eye. Don't look at it, don't touch it, just bring your attention to that part of your forehead. Curiosity. Experience what it feels like inner journey in your body. And ask your guide to join you. And then become that eye of perception. And take that eye of perception into your body into a place where you have unhappy cells. If you feel like you need some protection around yourself and your guide, imagine you're surrounded by a protective clear shield. Journey to the place of dis-ease. and ask those cells any questions you might have. For example, what is going on? Why are you here? Do you have a message for me? What do you want me to learn from you?
where you can ask your guide, what did the impressions that I received mean? What do you suggest I do with them? What else would be useful for me to know to heal? and gradually return to the room. One woman in Columbus listened to this and she'd been having shoulder pain and she realized when she was done that she was carrying too many responsibilities. So the visualization helped her understand what she needed to do. And then Walt can also give you clues about what behaviors and attitudes you can adjust to help yourself heal. After we change our attitudes and reconstruct our behaviors, we can begin to make some major life choices. One might be to leave a high-stress situation. Maggie was diagnosed with breast cancer. At the time, their husband was having an affair. Think they're connected? Well, she got a divorce, she saw a therapist, and learned how to manage her emotions in a healthy way. She was clear for six years. Same cancer came back on the other side. Not metastatic, just the same kind. Like, hmm. So she went back and read the writer's book again. And some sections she read over and over and over again and came to the conclusion that what she needed to do was to sell the house that she was living in with all those sad memories and buy a condo downtown where she could be happy. So she sold her house, bought her condo, she's happy, and the cancer is gone. So sometimes there might be a high stress situation that's causing us to have self-defeating things going on that we can change if we make a big choice. Another is to end an unhealthy relationship. Amy was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. She had a great husband, she had a beautiful daughter, family life was great, she healed her life with a therapist, but her problem relationship was with her mother. So after reading Fiber Soup, she decided that her healing strategy was to stop having any contact with her mother. She was able to do that for six months. Cancer was stable. She opened the door back up to that relationship. Nine months later, she passed away from the cancer. When we say toxic relationships are toxic, they really are toxic. And sometimes you have to leave everything you know to get into a healthy place. So you have a chance of surviving. And I believe that if we do those kinds of things that help comes. And if you want to know my story, I can talk about that, but at the signing table. And another is to approach the cancer from every angle. Leave no stone unturned, especially if it's late stage. You don't have the luxury of playing around. You've got to get to it. Now, in my book, I talk about how to manage chemotherapy, how to keep your fingernails, how to get rid of that nasty taste in your mouth. How to avoid the Neupogen and Neulastashots. I had 42 days of chemotherapy. I had one shot. I talk, how to, I talk in my book about how to avoid those shots because there are things you can do. One of the most helpful things for me was a visualization created by a Tai Chi Grandmaster. 
He's all through my book. I use this visualization once or twice a day and found it extremely helpful. It's a, called bone marrow healing. And surgery. I have my top five surgery tips in my book. When I follow my own advice, I get out of the hospital a day early. When I don't follow my advice, I stay in the hospital longer. I've had seven major surgeries, so I'm a veteran. But I found what works. And then there's all these areas that we can approach cancer from in other areas besides medical. Physical. There's acupressure, there's Reiki, there's all kinds of physical healing modalities that you can try out. I've got a lot of good list in my book. Nutrition. How to improve your nutritional status. I talk about how to do that in my book. I've got a section about that with all the background research. Social. Important to have healthy social relationships. Talk a little bit about that in my book. Emotional. Wanting a good attitude with equanimity. Mental. What do we do about our thoughts? How do we manage stress? How do we activate our will to get things to happen so that we can change our attitudes, behaviors, and make choices? And spiritually, finding a spiritual practice that works for you, not just one that you think you should do. Because this is where we want to be. I'm not talking about curing. I'm talking about raising up life force energy in the body so the body can rebalance itself and possibly shed the illness. Now, some people might heal their lives doing all these things and still pass from cancer. But it's a whole lot nicer to have healed your life than to have not and pass. So I'm open for questions now. Yes. If there was a number one aspect that really was the key for you of all the change that you made during this process, what would it be? It was leaving an unhealthy relationship. It was too stressful. But if I had not done all these other things, I would not be here. Yes? I actually have a fairly big microphone. Yeah, we're all with the recording. First off, Heidi, thank you for sharing your journey with us. It's very brave of you to disclose post-healing. question, please, as a health professional, is what did your physician say who had told you to get your affairs in order after you came back way better with much less risk and issue and discomfort and challenge? And was there any kind of curious investigation on their part in terms of what did you do and can we offer this to our other patients? No, I was not asked. Now, he did stand outside my uh, room when I went for my three and a half year appointment and I heard him whisper to the nurse, she's been clean for three and a half years, because he was shocked. But no, I was not asked. Um, Thank you. But he did say that I had the best blood panels of any patient he'd ever had. <laughs> Anybody else? Describe a little bit how we can learn that practice of experiencing the emotion for 90 seconds and then letting it go. You don't, you don't want to be making stories up about, about what's going on. You don't want to be thinking about what's going on. You don't want to be analyzing anything. You just want to pay attention to the physical sensations in your body. 
like, oh, I've got butterflies in my stomach. But you don't even think it. You just experience it. And, you, and I also learned, oh, this has taken a long time. Don't even think that. Just stop the thinking and exist only in your body for 90 seconds. And then it will live. And then you think, oh, it's over. I can go do something else now. So you don't make it go away. Your body lets it go. The body lets it go within 90 seconds. The body clears it out of the bloodstream. Because its purpose is for fight, flight, freeze. That's why it's there. And we don't need that. Because we're not out in the wilderness. We're in about there. How do you know when the 90 seconds is up? How do you know when the 90 seconds is up? <laughs> your, your body will feel different. You will feel the butterflies with. You will feel, it'll move around. It'll get intense. Like, I, it might start as butterflies. It might move into heat and pressure in my head. It might move down my left leg as tension. After 90 seconds, it will lift. But if you pay attention, you'll notice it. You'll feel it. Now, it might take some practice. It took a lot of practice for me to get this because I had lived in my head all my life. I had to get in my body. All right, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Oh, sorry, one more question. Um, um, I, I like what you said about leaving an unhealthy relationship, about stress in the body. And as somebody who um, is a single parent with stage four cancer, I have at times had to deal with the legal system in terms of ending an unhealthy relationship and keeping myself and my child protected. And what I find, what, what I did was I correlated blood pressure levels and um, other things in my own chart to show this is what my health was like when I was in the relationship. This is how my health was like a year after the relationship. This is what my health was like when he re-entered the picture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, I have been told by um, many lawyers that I sound sort of hysterical when bringing that type of data to the table. You've done a great job in putting together this book about stress. Do you have um, empirical data referenced in your book that would be useful to speak to the legal community about the effects of stress and cancer and how to move forward keeping cancer patients protected from these external stressors? Let me get back with you at, at the book signing table because I know our time's up. Thank you.